Here we are on the beautiful Adnamurkin Peninsula. Quite a treat. The weather is absolutely glorious. For the next four days, we have come here with a group of international journalists to test not one, but two new products that Blaser have recently launched, which is, for one, the R8 Silence with an integrated full-length moderator and the new Blaser Optic, with, for me personally, is going to be its first outing in an actual real-life environment, so quite exciting stuff. We're here as guests of West Highland Hunting's Neil Roundtree. What we're looking to do at this time of year, we're particularly looking to weed out poorer hinds and earlier in the season you'll find that the animals that haven't done well over the summer and winter and particularly with the cycle of weather we've had the last three years they stand out quite early on in the, in the, in the winter period so ideally you get them away so you, you're taking away competition for grazing but you're also taking away animals before there's any welfare issues where you know as a particularly old hinds so what we're trying to do is fulfill the role of the predator and take them out the other thing we're trying to do is because we have a population of deer that are contained on the Ardnamurkin Peninsula, we're trying to make sure that that population doesn't get out with the carrying capacity of the, of the ground the deer are on. In the days that we have in front of us, we have a spell of decent weather, haven't had it for a few weeks. So what we'll try and do is get ahead with the hinds. And we'll be looking between hinds and calves to shoot between 15 and 20 animals in the next uh, four days. Our stalking ground will be testing for both rifle and stalkers. It's the Ardnamurkin Peninsula. Only accessible by boat, this is the perfect opportunity to test the rifle's seaworthiness. Then there's a good old bump around in an Argo to put the scope and mounts through their paces. We were hunting here in October, the water was just running down here like two streams. It doesn't take long for Neil to spot hinds feeding up on the hill. One lane down looking right at it. It's kind of where I expected them to be today to be honest. What we will find, I mean, it, you typically how groups of deer sort of create themselves, you'll get a hind will break away from a group, and then you'll get the hind and calf, and then you get the hind calf and follower scenario. And if that's left unchecked, then what will naturally happen is that group will gain momentum and strength, and it will start to vie for its own hefted area. And if you don't want the population to get a lot bigger, then what we try and do in this landscape here is that in the west coast, you'll find up to 10 deer do well in a group. Groups bigger than that, you'll find when the weather's hard, it's harder for them to get into shelter. So what we try and do, and I've always done as a practice, is try and keep the groups in the, in the west relatively small. And um, when I see satellite groups breaking off, unless I want to trade that breaking off group for the group I currently have, because you might say, well, they are superior, what you'll do is you'll whip that group away. So you'll keep group size where you want it, but anything that tries to establish itself, you'll, you'll take that away. So that's the social aspects of it. And, and if you shoot a, a, a hind and a calf, and, and the, what the Germans call the schmaltier, the, the, the yearling from the year before, it's not particularly kind to her to leave her wandering on her own. There's a hind for a calf and follower 180 metres away. 550 yards away, there are two hinds and two calves. And then straight over the top of the hill, at 50 metres, is a big hind and a calf. She is quite good. These ones over here, so so. And the four of the brain, two are okay, two are not so good. My thoughts are that we take these three, it's probably easier to get our own set up first. So I'll try and get them a little bit. I need to point you out so you can see them. The old deer is on the set left, okay? Which one? You wait, you see three. Wait till I get Robert in position. I'll get him to shoot the first one on the left. You, okay, Robert will shoot the first one on the left. You shoot the furthest one to the right, okay? The calf and then the small deer.
It's down. When people look at deer, they, they need to think about the, the management of a natural resource, which is a component of a landscape. This isn't purely about deer. This is about deer as a resource that we can sustainably use here, that we have to balance with other things. So there's other people in this landscape that farm, that croft, that grow trees, that have uh, aspirations which are entirely sensible, and we have to manage and balance our deer management aspirations to allow them to deliver what they want without conflict. You'll hear classic population models of sort of 40% uh, recruitment, 2 to 5% mortality. Th that might be nice in an ideal world, but the last three years in particular, that's not been the case in the west coast of Scotland. And uh, in some areas, you know, recruitment's fallen to as low as 20%. And uh, you need to factor that in. So what you're doing is you're running constantly ahead, and particularly when you're trying to produce mature stags, which are the life's blood of a highland uh, deer forest. You want to make sure that you're factoring four, five, and six years down the road. Because if you don't, and I think we will see it in the, in the next five, six years' time, people will be uh, becoming quite distressed that there's no mature stags about. And it's not just a case of any stag will do. There's pretty clear evidence that a lack of mature males will extend the period of the rut, which in its turn will have a knock-on effect on the population. You want a short, sharp rut, because you want all the calves born as early in that uh, summer window as you can get to increase the chances of winter survival. Next day, we take on a different bit of ground, open moorland on the edge of a forestry block in windy, drizzly weather. A nice, gentle Scottish day. What we do here is places where we want them to come in and out of the forest. We've lowered the fence here so the deer in really hard weather can get into shelter. And what you're naturally seeing here is hinds working off the forest edge. Given the opportunity, red deer will naturally behave this way. They don't carry a lot of fat, it's what makes them good to eat. But having access to shelter makes a huge difference to how well they do. He's coming out in front of us. You see them? No, no, she's killed, she's killed, don't worry. There's a very red-coloured beast stood there, do you see it? Just line yourself up on that red-coloured one, Robert. It's going to move up a bit there. When it does, if that bottom beast gives you broadside... Is it giving you broadside, not yet? Good man. Right, what's this third one doing? Is it th it's down, so watch and see what the third one does. 
standing broadside yeah take it good shot straight down what i would say is that the overall standard of marksmanship is is constantly improving people are a lot more diligent about practicing years ago people had their father or their grandfather's rifle they might fire it two or three times a year and then go hunting but consistently now particularly with european hunters the standard of marksmanship probably borne out too with the standard of equipment because nearly everybody you see now has a bipod be it a harris bipod or a spartan bipod everybody has a bipod with their rifle and good optics good bipods good rifles and decent bit of practice it adds to the end of the day to a successful hunt, which is what we've just seen. We've been lucky to work with uh, some of the best equipment on the market. In the world we live in, people expect the right kit to do the right job. And uh, there's an awful lot of people who will tell you that kit does the job. And uh, there's nothing more disappointing than, you know, you take it home, take it out of the packet and it doesn't work. Uh, and we very quickly learned that products like the, like the, the Blazer rifles, that the, they do what they say they're going to do and the great advantage is they do what they say they can do continuously and, and that's what we want and we, we see a lot of people bring them here every year we're fortunate we've got that kit ourselves so we we actually introduce people to stalking and, and, to, and to hunting using their equipment and this wants to be top notch so that when we actually put someone behind that firearm to say that animal needs to come out of the herd that you can be 100 percent sure that it's capable of delivering it and then there are other benefits. I mean, the blazer silence, for example, what is attractive to me about that is that the minimum disturbance when you go out and do that job is important. We use the rifle in woodland cover and uh, an unmoderated rifle, everybody in the group's head would have been ringing like a bell. That particular rifle, you hardly heard it. And in a confined space like that, shooting out from cover into the open, you would have thought the report would have been significant but you actually saw the deer react, that actually the impact of the bullet was the noisiest thing. So to me, that, that, that shows that technology is keeping pace with our aspirations. And that's what they do for us. And, and to cut to the chase, I mean, they're tack drivingly accurate out of the box. For many years, we did use different manufacturers' brands, and I, I won't be unkind to them at the moment and name them, but uh, th there seemed to be, for me, a problem that has been a race to the bottom and everybody wanted to make everything cheaper and more affordable. And, and you can only make things cheaper by trading away quality. Uh, and the thing I like about the Blazer rifle, the saddle mount system, for, for example, the, the tolerances are incredible. You can unhook that and hook it back on time after time and it doesn't budge. And if you're gonna spend a lot of money on a telescope and you're gonna spend a lot of money on a rifle, then the way you tie the two together is hugely important. And, and we're looking for things that are robust that they can bounce around in the back of an Argo cat. They can cope if a guy slips and falls on the hill and still get up and think, do I have to go home and zero my rifle now? And, and if you're in a position, position when you're managing an, a natural resource and that happens, then you've got the dilemma, do I take a risk or do I go back and try this rifle on the target? And, and if you've got products you can rely on, then you can say, you oh, know, that, that's fine. That weapon can cope with that and on you go.